call that holiday cheer? This is one of the sneakiest things a bartender could ever do. What's really going on in your supermarket? The deli counter is really kind of a hazmat zone. That turkey breast? That's a bunch of, of pieces of turkey meat that have been shoved into essentially a giant condom. Plus, pulling into the mall parking lot tonight, confessions from a car thief. Separating the whole door from the body of the vehicle. Are you driving the easiest model to steal? And do you really think you locked your car? Not when the thieves have one of these. This is like something out of James Bond. <laughs> And we can't forget about the pets this holiday. Tonight, the vet is confessing too. Who's really wearing the coat of shame? I'm saying things that need to be said that aren't being said. Follow 2020's Undercover Pup. A holiday guide like you've never seen. 2020 True Confessions. Here now, David Muir. Tonight, we take you on the inside, a revealing look behind the bar, the back room of the supermarket, into the mall parking lot, a ride along with a car thief. Use one of those remote locks. Is your car really locked after all? Deborah Roberts tells us tonight, don't be so sure. Stealing cars is a blast in Grand Theft Auto V. So fun, the video game made a billion dollars in its first three days on the market. But in real life, let's go, baby. Just take it. A car is stolen every 43 seconds. Make a right, make a right. Close to a million a year. <laughs> Steve Fuller used to do it all the time. So you were pretty good at what you did. Yes, I've taken a lot of cars. With six convictions for stealing cars, Steve says hundreds of other times he drove off scot free. Okay, so let's be clear. You're not stealing anybody's cars today? No. I stole cars because I was on drugs and I needed the money. Why are you talking to us about it? Because I've changed my life. I'd like to make up for some of the damage I did. So tonight, Steve's going to spill the beans on what thieves know that we don't. Starting with the biggest question, how do they choose which car to steal? You're basically shopping. Yeah, that's the plan. During the day, I would shop, and at night, I would get the presents. Well, there's lots of nice cars here. And what did he consider a nice car? You might be surprised. In TV shows like The Sopranos, the bad guy always steals the most expensive cars. In Eastern Europe, you can sell this car for 110, 120,000. My price to you, 90 grand. But in the everyday world of real life car theft, you got your toilet over here, you got your Nissan truck up here. Your clunker can be just as attractive. Now, most people would sort of assume that if it's a, an older car, you're not interested. That's not true. No, the older cars are way easier to take. In fact, the top two most stolen cars in 2012, Honda Civics and Accords, going all the way back to the 90s models. On the other hand, three models of Mercedes tied for fewest thefts in the U.S. last year. Did you almost always score? I'd say a good 90% of the time. And Steve's favorite location? See, that's perfect right there. A parking garage. An apartment complex to me means one-stop shopping. I can find whatever I need in one location. This looks pretty good to you then, huh? Yeah, this is a good, nice, secluded, dark underground spot. This is the candy shop right here. Glad he likes it since we set up this garage in LA for him to demonstrate how it's done. With the help of the LA County Sheriff's Office, Back in the we brought in three cars, then put cameras on Steve so we could see what he sees and set him off to show us how a thief would work. Two cars are locked up tight, but car number one, like many we spotted while driving around, has a barely open window. That's money. That's the easiest. It's cracked open maybe an inch, but for Steve, that's plenty. A window that has enough room for me to stick my fingers in. Let's get this open. I can get out of its track by rocking it back and forth. Pull just hard enough to get my arm down in there and reach in and unlock it. Bingo in less than 10 seconds. Now for car number two. So I'm gonna do is go ahead and use my tow truck lockout kit. What's in a lockout kit? Basically it's a wedge and an air bladder. I'll slide this airbag in. A few pumps of air. What it's doing is separating the whole door from the body of the vehicle. It's leaving me a gap to put my tool in. Let's take this tool, stick it right in here, like this, right down to the lock. 
Now I'm in. And he's inside car number two in less than a minute. Now for car number three, his least favorite method. Ready? I'd break a window. You'd break a window and risk the noise. Break it with what? Would you believe a smashed spark plug? A little piece of porcelain is all it takes. Throw the piece of porcelain at the glass. The glass will shatter and it'll stay in one piece. So it's one thing to get in, but you still don't have the key. No. So then what do you do? Sometimes he doesn't have to do anything. Many of us leave keys in obvious places. The ashtray, the door panel, center column. So we think we're being clever. They're just making it easy for me. That's how Steve started car number one. Yep, bingo, there's the key. But here's a scary secret. Even if you didn't leave a key in the car, the manufacturer may have put one there anyway. It's called a valet key. A lot of people are not aware that they have a valet key in their vehicle. There's a spare key in the car. Yes. And you know it, but the owner often doesn't. No, they don't. For example, in some BMWs, that valet key is in the toolkit. For a smart thief, easy pickings. But if he can't find that key, he creates one. I'm trying to thin it out a little bit, knock the edges down. Steve says a filed key can start a lot of cars. He tried one on car number two. I'm jiggling it back and forth in the ignition, trying to hit all the tumblers and get them engaged. It's not an exact science. But sometimes you put it in the ignition and boom. Yeah. You're off and running. And away he goes. Steve doesn't steal cars anymore, but was he kind of the classic car thief? Yeah, absolutely. Lieutenant Jeff Enfield runs an auto theft task force in Southern California, focusing on thieves like Steve used to be, but increasingly on high-tech modern crooks. Is it harder and harder to stay ahead of the... the oh, absolutely. Thieves? We know they're working every day to defeat the next device. A device like this one that prevents you from locking your car. As the driver gets out, he thinks he's automatically locking his car. But Lieutenant Enfield blocks the signal with this small transmitter. If this were real, the doors would remain unlocked. So you may want to click two or three times to be sure. These car thieves, they're computer hackers as well. They're getting into your vehicle, which is a large computer, and are able to hack into that system and obtain key codes and other information. Here's one way they do that. To plug in the device. This little gadget. We go to the function program key. First it hacks into your car's computer, then copies the data to start the car electronically. Okay. And mm -hmm. voila. The device will tell it to start the car. Press the key. The thief is on his way. This is like something out of James Bond. <laughs> It, it almost is, isn't it? It's crazy. Yeah, it is. We learn things every day from these car thieves out there. So what happens to your car after it's been swiped? Well, if you're lucky, it's just been taken on a quick joyride, and you'll get it back. Get your hands up! Let me see your hands! But these days, the pros are making the biggest bucks shipping Hot Wheels overseas, never to be seen again. And of course, there's the classic chop shop, where stolen cars are stripped down for parts, where Steve used to go. When you would start up a car and you drive off with this stolen car, what was that feeling like? Unfortunately, at the time, it was success. I got what I needed to support my addiction. I'm not thinking about, yeah, woohoo, let's just get the vehicle go. Confessions of a car thief tonight, and when we come back here, the secrets of the grocery store revealed what's really underneath that expiration date. But first, the vet confesses. But are they selling you something you don't need? Our undercover pup. It's the big upsell. Get that dog back in, it's going to be much more profitable. The vet in the doghouse. Twenty Twenty's True Confessions continues with Confessions of a Veterinarian. Now, Gio Benitez. Say hello to maybe. This lovable mutt is coming to visit us at ABC News headquarters for a very special assignment. Welcome to ABC. Thank you. We're very oh, excited to be here. Maybe we're going to make maybe a star. No, not that kind of star. Cut. We're sending this brave five-year-old pooch undercover into a place dogs fear the most. Come on. 
It's okay. It's okay. A veterinary clinic. We wanted to find out if what this man says about the veterinary business is true. That some vets out to make a buck sell unnecessary shots, tests, and procedures to unsuspecting pet owners. I'm clearly not making friends within the veterinary industry, but I feel I'm saying things that need to be said that aren't being said. Andrew Jones worked as a vet for 17 years until he quit the industry after a dispute with his medical board over marketing issues. He's now revealing what he calls veterinary secrets online. As a young veterinarian in British Columbia working at a clinic, Jones says he got an early lesson about upselling after telling a pet owner just to monitor a lump on their dog. Jones says the clinic owner quickly clued him in on the effectiveness of using the dreaded C word. The practice owner said, no, that's not how you do it. What you need to do is get that dog back in. And what did he tell the pet owner? He said that it might be cancer, and it's usually word, the, the C word, pet owners get really concerned. Was it cancer? No, it was a benign fatty tumor. Throughout his career, Jones says he discovered a dark reality about some veterinarians in the U.S. and Canada, including himself. They feel that pressure of, I've got these overhead costs to make, and that's where your judgment gets clouded. Jones says, under pressure from bosses, he ordered services that were not needed. Did you feel that you might get fired if you didn't do that? No question. If I didn't meet this certain target, then yeah, my employment was at threat. But Jones tells us even when he owned his own clinic, he at times continued upselling, admitting to using the teeth cleaning come on. So for instance, seeing a, a dog that has a little bit of tartar, then I might say, I think your dog should have a dental cleaning. Obviously more profitable for the practice. Do vets really push unneeded services, as Jones claims? Well, that brings us back to our undercover canine, maybe. We decide to send a healthy dog, which maybe certainly appears to be, into vet clinics to see what tests and treatments are recommended. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Kramer. To make sure that maybe is in good shape, her owner Katrina takes her to this Manhattan clinic for a thorough checkup with a well-respected vet. Her teeth are very clean. I can tell that you're paying some attention to keeping her teeth clean. According to Dr. Rebecca Campbell, Maybe is completely healthy. So we send her undercover into vet clinics for a routine exam. Most of the places found that Maybe is just fine. Except for a tiny bit of tartar, I think she's good. But check out what we heard during an exam at this clinic in New Jersey. The vet takes a quick look at Maybe's teeth. There's a little bit of tartar buildup back there, and you can't brush it effectively. After the owner asks what she should do, the vet recommends an annual teeth cleaning. For dogs, that means going under general anesthesia. She could have a lot more stuff going on, and I'd never see it unless she was under anesthesia. The clinic later gives us Maybe's exam report, which indicates she has dental disease. The cost of that recommended teeth cleaning under general anesthesia, $250. So you say dentistry is the upsell? It's a big upsell. Uh, very much on the McDonald's equation of would you like fries with that. The vet later stood by her advice, saying that larger dogs over the age of four can benefit from a cleaning, and risks posed by anesthesia are minimal. For another perspective, we turn to Dr. Marty Becker, one of the country's leading experts in veterinary care. I wouldn't recommend the cleaning unless it needed it. If it does not have periodontal disease, there's no use putting it through the risk of anesthesia. Because doing things that a dog doesn't need can be dangerous. Absolutely can be dangerous. Another big ticket item on vet bills, vaccination costs. And Jones says some vets can be quick when it comes to pushing the shots. Every year, pet owners get those reminder cards that their animals are due for a vaccination. But what many vets apparently fail to disclose is that according to the latest guidelines, most of the main vaccines only need to be given once every three years. A lot of people are still into giving them every year, but that is not the recommended protocol by the American Veterinary Medical Association. To find out what vets recommend about vaccinations, we bring in another undercover dog, a five-year-old pit bull mix named Honey. Her owner, Allison, says Honey's up to date on all of her vaccines. But without asking about Honey's vaccination status, this vet orders up a regimen of shots. Did you bring the shots in? She's getting shots? Shots? We remind the vet this is just a checkup. 
Oh, okay. I was told annuals. Okay. Oh, no, no. Uh, when were we last vaccinated? It was uh, two years ago. She had rabies in December. Okay. She's okay. Okay. Um, distemper is typically an annual vaccine. But industry guidelines say the vaccine for distemper, a viral disease, is good for three years. The clinic later told us that a vet's individual judgment is just as important. So what else happened with our pretty pit bull who was checked out as being in good shape? Well, Honey also received a finding of dental disease from a clinic and a recommendation for a $300 teeth cleaning under general anesthesia. So you definitely recommend a dental cleaning? Definitely recommend it. When we later called the clinic, nobody would answer our questions about the proposed treatment. In the end, both of our undercover dog owners could have incurred hundreds of dollars for potentially unnecessary treatments. Jones says what ultimately drives pet owners to pay up is their deep love for their animals. Do you think some vets take advantage of pet owners who just really don't know any better? Of course, because you can. I mean, because you're, you're preying on their emotion. When we asked the industry association about upselling allegations, they said it's up to pet owners to decide whether to follow a vet's recommendation. At the end of the day, Jones says the vast majority of vets are ethical and try to do the right thing. Hi. Still, he says pet owners need to walk into a clinic with their eyes wide open. They're not just going to veterinary clinic, they're going to a business. So start to really question stuff that is recommended or advised, and you really can you know, take charge of your own pet's health. Next, confessions of a bartender. You ordered it, you paid for it, but what's really in the glass? I ripped you off with half as much liquor, and you think it's a better drink. 2020, serving up secrets. Heading out for holiday cheer, tonight we go behind the bar here. That drink you ordered, what's really in your glass? Only the bartender knows for sure. Amy Robach with the bartenders serving up confessions tonight. Friday night, step into a bar almost anywhere. And you'll find people looking to unwind, bust loose, and get their drink on. But someone has to run the party. And that someone is the master of mixology, the bartender. Because ultimately, you're in control. You've got yes, the alcohol right exactly, now, and yeah. that's what they want. The customer's king in the service business, but it's, you know, it's not absolute. Whether it's absolute, Heineken, or Jack Daniels, Ben Molina has poured it all. I'm thinking we're doing something, something fun, something exciting with whiskey. And there you are. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Enjoy. And the bartender and co-owner of Cinco in Los Angeles poured it all out to us, revealing all the little ways barkeeps can mess with customers they don't like. How do you deal with rude drunk people? Um, there are steps you can take. Steps bartenders rather you don't know, such as step one, the silent treatment. An obnoxious customer might simply get ignored. Deliberately not get their next drink. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You have that power. You can make them wait. Yes. Step two, the disappearing liquor treatment. The next drink might come minus the alcohol. You get nasty when people want their drinks. And step three, how about the Visine treatment? A few drops and an unscrupulous bartender can send you running to the bathroom or home. Sometimes the Visine is a better alternative than a fight. John Taffer is the host of the Spike TV Bloody show Bar, bar Rescue. Every me. week he finds it's another design. bar with another dirty secret. I got your freaking game, and I know exactly what you're up to. And here's his sad but true confession. Some bars mess with everybody, not just the rowdy drunk. How often have you found bars ripping off the customer? You know, all too often. He met with us at New York's Marquee Club to demonstrate how easy it is for a bartender to cheat you by demonstrating three cocktail cons. Number one, the short pour. I'm going to charge you for a full drink and give you about half a drink. And I'm not going to know. You won't know it. I'm going to take an ounce of scotch and put it in the shot glass. I'm going to take about a half an ounce and put it in that shot glass. It's less until you add this. 
crushed ice, the key to the con. One of the things you look out for in a bar is crushed ice in the bin. Who knew? Watch what happens. Look at the difference. It looks almost the same. That even still looks a little more. Short pour, big rip off. So you can pour a lot less and make it look the same. You got it. So if I top this with cola, look at how little it takes. So this one I ripped you off with half as much liquor, and you think it's a better drink. Wow. Number two, the long pour. This is what we call the long pour. What you think is the long pour. I give you a look, how are you? That real special look. Little twinkle Let in your eye. Let me take care of you. Right, I put my bottle up. Wow. Long pour. You think you got a lot? You didn't. When you lift that arm, you create the illusion of quantity. It's all illusion. You felt special. And I'm ripping you off. And last but not least, number three, the sneaky pour. This is one of the sneakiest things a bartender could ever do. You're going to see me pour a real lot. Three, four, five, six, seven. Now that's as much time as two and a half ounces of liquor would be. John fills the drink with soda and plops in a straw. A nice looking drink, but he's ripped you off. How? Every liquor bottle has an air hole. When I cover that air hole with my finger, the fluid stops coming out. Here's the normal pour. Normal. With my finger. He pours a weak drink, but you're convinced it's strong because of this. Straw sitting in a glass of vodka hidden behind the bar. But when I take that straw out and I put it in your drink, what's the first sip you're going to get out of that straw? This is a good, strong drink. Straight vodka. And after that, you forget that the drink is kind of weak. Forget it. You're saying, John, great drink. Great drink. And you're throwing the tips at me. But Taffer says bars don't even need to know this sleight of hand to con you. And in a bar business, sometimes people are losing so much money and they get desperate. They'll do whatever it takes. That they do. For instance, the oldest trick in the bartending book, pouring cheap stuff into empty bottles of top shelf liquor or simply watering down the booze. Easy to do, very hard to prove. I don't think that tastes like Ted Gray. It tastes cheap. Can you really taste the difference if it's mixed in something else? I would say probably... 90% of people know. Have no idea what alcohol they're actually drinking. They wouldn't know the difference between a well vodka and a great goose. Or, you know. Back in Los Angeles, Ben's helping us put that to the test. We bring in two panels of four volunteers. We're going to have a little fun here. Ben mixes three vodka and cranberry drinks for each of them. One with Grey Goose, the other two using a brand no one knows, Nikolai. This is a bottom of the barrel vodka. The drinks all look the same. Go. Will they taste different? Go with your instincts. Pick which one you think is Grey Goose. All right, we'll let the games begin. Yeah, they're all great. I'm really battling between two of them. It's hard. The Grey Goose is in glass number one for every person. On the count of three, one, two, two three, three, reveal. Both times it's the same. Three out of four drinkers get it wrong. They would have been easy victims. Yeah, that is un kind of unsettling, yeah. I, I, I definitely would feel ripped off. Kind of makes you think, like, well, why is this alcohol so much more expensive if you can't tell the difference between the two? That's what Todd Tarzinski wants to know, too. He was a regular customer at this TGI Fridays in New Jersey. His usual drink? Thank you. What else? Grey Goose with cranberry juice. I'm not usually watching the bartender simply because I never thought I had to. But then he heard some wild news, something called Operation Swill. More info is coming out about Operation Swill. Cheaper liquors disguised in top shelf bottles. The New Jersey Attorney General busted 29 bars all around the state, including that TGI Fridays, accusing them of not just serving their customers the wrong booze, but even worse, rubbing alcohol. TGI Friday settled, but admitted no wrongdoing. I was shocked. I was very angry and shocked. Todd was so upset, he sued. A class action which his lawyer says could be just the tip of the iceberg. It's the epitome of desperation. It's stupidity. Bottom line, want a stress-free trip to the bar? What is your ultimate advice for people when they walk up to a bar? Be educated. Understand what a poor looks like how much alcohol you should be getting. I mean, the most important way you guarantee good service is leave when you don't get it. Thank you. A 2020 contacted the franchise owners of those TGIF restaurants that were sued in New Jersey, who told us that there was never evidence of a widespread problem and that the true facts will emerge in court. 
In the meantime, tonight, what about you? Have you ever wondered what's really in the glass? Ever think you've been fooled? Tweet us. Use the hashtag ABC2020. And next, right here, you've got to hear the confessions at the supermarket. Coming up, we go behind the plastic curtain. What's hiding underneath the expiration sticker? From blade to counter to scale, the secrets of the deli counter reveal. Hard to believe, but Thanksgiving is already next week, and many of you will be in the grocery aisles this weekend. Juju Chang tonight with the insiders revealing eye opening supermarket secrets. With Thanksgiving and the holiday feasting season firing up, you need to know the lowdown on that weekly pilgrimage to the grocer. Think about it. After rent or mortgage, it's often your second biggest monthly bill. Don't forget, your friendly neighborhood grocery store is part of a $600 billion business, and they're always looking to make a few dollars more. So grocers are counting on us to be lazy. Correct. Do the least amount of work. So we've assembled our own team of grocery insiders to pull back those plastic curtains. Veteran grocer Pete Napolitano, a.k.a. Produce Pete. Former store owner Maurice Nizardo, a.k.a. The Supermarket Suit. Lawyer for the Center for Science in the Public Interest, Sarah Klein, a.k.a. The Clean Queen. And our former cashier, Victor Pizarro, a.k.a. The Cranky Cashier. Now, before you even begin shopping, understand grocery shopping is a mind game. The grocer wants you in the store. They want to sell you what they want to sell you. They want you to come on the day they want you to come on. Well, everybody wants to shop on a Saturday, so the grocer will make specials effective Monday and Tuesday. So it's a retail seduction. It's a retail seduction. What's the first thing you grab walking in? Well, there's something you should know about those carts. Grocery store carts are germy, infested with whatever little bacteria anybody else who's passed the grocery store that day is carrying. She's not exaggerating. In fact, a 2011 study found 72% of the carts they swabbed in four different states tested positive for fecal bacteria. Eesh. Wipe off that handle with an antibacterial wipe. Now look at all these apples we have here. When it comes to picking produce, pay heed to Pete's words of wisdom about pineapples. Now you see this pineapple here. You want the break in color. Break in color. So, so what does that mean? You see how it goes green and see how this is starting to break? The color is starting to break. Buying berries? Ever wonder what those colored pads on the bottom of the container are for? There's a secret behind them. See this pad here? Yeah. If it starts to go bad, that's going to stain up, so you know that the raspberries are going to go bad. And Pete says grocers gussy up the veggies with those spritzer hoses, but it's all for show. The water on the produce is for one reason and one reason only. It makes it look better. But water starts the, the deterioration process. So remember, dry your wet produce. So when you get it home, you're going to shake it really good. Shake it good. Pete's old school. I don't even wash it when I eat it. Which might horrify our germ tracker, Sarah. Almost 50 million Americans get sick from foodborne illness every year. The Food Marketing Institute sent us a statement saying in part that grocers are in business to serve their customers by providing safe, nutritious, affordable food. And food safety is the number one priority for supermarkets. But sometimes your produce can be a little too fresh. One woman claims she found, no joke, killer spiders from Brazil in a bunch of bananas she bought at her grocer. An extreme case, but did you know non-lethal insect parts are perfectly legal in our groceries? The Food and Drug Administration allows a certain amount of insects and even rodent hairs in a lot of our food. Although it's unpleasant, it's not likely to be unsafe. Some rodent hair might be allowed, but make sure your store has a handle on any feasting pests, even though they may try to hide the evidence. The people of the store were actually like, we need to set up mouse traps behind aisles and in between shelves because there is obviously an issue. That's not good for business. It's really not. So like they try to hide it. And it might not just be mice, we according to Victor. So I pull the cart and I hear a noise and then I look down. I want to say a roach like this big. Now the deli is a popular stop off for shoppers and sometimes bacteria. 
The deli counter is really kind of a hazmat zone in uh, grocery stores, and that's because Listeria, which is one of our kind of hardiest and most dangerous bacteria, can live on plastic and metal. From the blade to the counter to the scale, it can be a walk down Listeria lane. No wonder pregnant women are advised to steer clear of some deli items. In fact, it's such a concern that in May, the USDA and FDA released a report outlining ways delis can reduce the risk of listeria contamination. So Sarah says, watch out for a dirty deli. Even prepackaged meat can have listeria, but it's probably the safer choice. One of the most important things you can do with deli meat, no matter where you're getting it from, is use it or toss it within three days. And here's a fun fact. Sarah says not all those hunks of ground or boneless turkey are from one animal. It's called a chub. That's not the shape of an animal in real life. That's a bunch of pieces of turkey meat that have been shoved into essentially a giant condom. All our insiders say, look for deals in the store. The manufacturers pay to have their item at eye level. So if we go away from the eye level, we're actually maybe looking for some bargains. Yes, that's true. But look closely. This ain't four-star dining. What should consumers know about markdown items? Those are usually like the things that are closest to expiration, or kind of like the island of misfit toys type thing. And sometimes the products could have been mishandled. Grocery store gross outs are a YouTube favorite. You just never know if someone's gonna take a sledgehammer, for instance, to your poultry. Now, you might think you're being super savvy by inspecting expiration dates, but guess what? They mean jack squat in most of the country. The FDA doesn't even require date labeling. Nine states don't even ask for them. And 30 states allow food to be sold past the original use-by date. So your grocer might be legally allowed to put new dates on expired items. Beef brisket, good to September 19th? Ah, make that September 30th. Chicken, which says used by June 2nd. On second thought, June 10th. They say guaranteed fresh, but how good is that promise? Now, most grocery stores do a great job of keeping things clean and taking care of their customers. But just make sure you keep your eyes open. Or you might come home with something you never intended to buy. Let's go, let's go. Next, what do those big rig truckers know that we don't? If the driver's not actually looking for you, he's going to push you off the road. Take a ride behind the wheel and find out what really happens at those truck stops after dark. Twenty Twenty's True Confessions continues now with Confessions of a Trucker. Here's Jim Avila. They are imposing and nameless road warriors barreling down the highway. Eighteen wheels of thundering mastodon in our rearview mirror. I think the general public might look at us and think that we are kind of dirty, uneducated. But surprise, in today's economy, you're just as likely to find guys like Lauren West behind the wheel of a big rig. That's going to be burned off in a day and a half. A 46-year-old college graduate, he let us ride along in his flatbed, vividly labeled a skateboard in trucker slang, and spilled secrets from his life on the road. This trip is going to be from Cloquet, Minnesota to Pearland, Texas, 23 hours, 1,400 miles should be able to do it in less than two and a half days. But first, his daily check under the hood. The brake chamber, slack adjuster. Securing his 43,000 pounds of ceiling tile and inspecting all of his 18 tires. The danger shredded tire debris, known as alligators, can send a car swerving and unsecured cargo can become a vicious projectile like this wooden plank. But trucking is one of the deadliest jobs because we're just as big a danger to them as they are to us. Aggressive, hyperactive cars, truckers call them bunny hoppers. That was a close one. Two vehicles in a row took a chance and cut in front of a big truck. Get away from my truck, Get away from my truck. And take a look at what can happen when one vehicle does cut in front of the other. Don't move or I'm going to choke you out. The rage can spill out of the cab and onto the road. Yeah. 
The burly car driver got in the most slugs, but the truck driver was taken away in cuffs for allegedly throwing a bottle at the car. Baby, cut me off. Unexpected hazards are part of the job. And if there's a sharp turn in the road or something like that, yeah, you're getting cut off. Sorry. <laughs> Ryan Morris is a 30-year veteran of the road. Joking aside, he confesses the fear of accidents looms large in a trucker's mind. So what have these guys learned? Here now, the truck driver's top tips to avoid becoming roadkill. First of all, not everyone can hold a line like these two stunt drivers in a new Volvo truck commercial with Jean-Claude Van Damme's manhood at their mercy. Many truckers on the road are newcomers. Beware of the rookie rock. Because they'll be going down the road, they'll, they'll be wiggling. Don't forget bad weather can exaggerate the slightest of mistakes. And rain can quickly blind the driver. It's actually more dangerous to drive in the rain than it is the snow or the ice because of the mist that comes off the track and trailer. And always maintain eye contact, even if it's a reflective gaze. When you're passing a truck and you look at that mirror, if you can't see that driver, that means he can't see you either. If the driver's not actually looking for you, he's gonna push you off the road. Yes, there's no highway terror quite like a truck wreck. Whether it's jackknifing, smashing into an overpass, or deadly pileups. In fact, truck fatalities have increased for three consecutive years. That's why most drivers have a Big Brother type computer on board, monitoring their every move. You have 11 hours and zero minutes of remaining drive time. There's no room for cheating. But truckers can be innovative. Just two weeks ago, investigators released video of this trucker allegedly using his wallet to block the company's dash cam. He seems to be cruising Facebook on his phone, and it does not end well. The distracted driver plows into parked police and fire vehicles. So how does a trucker safely avoid boredom for 11 hours behind the wheel? The best source of entertainment may be right out the window. Truckers confess it's the great view they have of you. I have seen everything from intercourse to completely naked drivers getting dressed. And the CB is the worst thing because somebody said, hey, there's a really good looking girl, we got a low cut top. I'm sorry, honey, I, just, I don't look. <laughs> when the driving day is done, truckers often pull into a full service truck stop for the night. The Ritz, it is not. And the cuisine? Perfect. You smell that? Took me three minutes to cook, three minutes to eat. No home cooking, but plenty of home sickness. Call home. Lauren only spends a handful of nights at home each month. You get your homework done? Okay, tell Petey and Jack I love them. All right, bye. Lauren spends his downtime alone, while some bring their own four-legged friends. But for others, when the loneliness hurts too bad, there are options for paid companionship. Truckers label lot lizards, ladies of the night. You've been away from your wife for two or three months on the road. We're here to provide whatever these truck drivers need. I have been propositioned a lot. First of all, I would never do that to my wife. Second of all, I don't want something that I can't get rid of either. <laughs> Lauren wakes up with a clean conscience the next morning. Get up and run a baby wipe over my face. The luxury of a hot shower can cost 10 bucks. So most truckers just skip it. Ready to go. The longest I've been was four days without a shower. No, there's not much glamor to trucking, and they are only paid when the tires are moving. So with all that downtime away from home factored in, their hourly wages add up to as little as five bucks for a critical job. Lauren finally makes it safely to Texas and unloads his cargo. This is the hardest part. With his load finished, Lauren is looking forward to the long ride home and spending nights again with his family. Once I'm done, get cleaned up, get something to eat, head on down to the road, it's worth it. And that's our program for tonight. Good luck this weekend getting ready for the holiday. I'm David Muir. For Elizabeth and all of us here at 2020, thanks for watching. I'll see you here this weekend. Good night.